All right, so we are we are very lucky to have Wenda Zhao today uh, from Colombia uh, to talk to us about uh, perspectives on cross validations. Hi, Wen. Uh, thanks all for coming. So today I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some ideas around cross validation that have been uh, going on recently, uh, and especially my work recently on uh, different ideas around cross validation and uh, both parametric and high dimensional. So probably everyone in the, this room knows what cross validation is, but let me just kind of give some notation to set, set the scene. So usually uh, we have some loss that we care about, and uh, so for a fixed hypothesis f, which describes kind of how the data behaves, uh, we are interested in this risk. So which is the expression on the data changing distribution of the loss of our hypothesis. Now, uh, in most cases, we don't have access to this directly because we don't know the data changing distribution. Instead, we have access to some samples. So suppose you have like n samples of the data changing distribution. Then what you can do is you can compute uh, the empirical risk of uh, the estimate, which uh, you just replace the expression by the empirical expression. Now, uh, Again, usually uh, we don't care about specific fixed uh, hypothesis, but rather we're going to try to use some data to get estimated hypothesis and then compute the risk from that. So in that case, the risk of the estimator is, again, defined the same way. Um, now, again, this is an expression with the data changing distribution, and we don't have access to this. So when I try to maybe we'll be to put these two things together. Unfortunately, this doesn't really work. So this is you know, usually known as the in sample estimate of the risk, and uh, we all know that it's biased because uh, what you did is you used the same data to both uh, estimate your hypothesis and try to evaluate how well it did. And usually there's some minimization involved in the estimation, and so this is biased. Um, so maybe the, the first idea to try to kind of reduce this bias and produce something reasonable is to do sample splitting. So what you do is we need to reserve some of our samples for training and some of samples for testing. And so here, I'm going to call it the split estimator. And what we do is say we get two thirds of sample from these, we obtain our estimator, and on the remaining ones, we use this to compute the risk. Uh, now, this is an uh, unbiased estimator of uh, the risk on you know, two thirds of your data. And uh, if, say, you split out a constant proportion of your data uh, and your estimator is parametric, then as it goes to infinity, it's asymptotically unbiased uh, for the risk uh, on n data points also. Now, what might seem to be a problem, although we'll see whether it is or not, is that essentially uh, we gave up a third of data. So on this third of data, we never use this to uh, enhance our estimates or anything like this. We never use this for estimation, we only use it for estimating the risk. And so maybe we think, you know, gathering data is usually expensive, we don't have that much of it, maybe we can try to improve that by kind of rotating through. So of course this is what cross-validation is. I agree, the format for cross-validation is way more complicated than it should be. And uh, the easiest way to think like this, we made the risk on one of the splits where we train on the rest, we rotate through, and then we average those. So cross validation in some sense is this averaged version of the split estimator. And so of course uh, a natural question is, you know, is cr the cross validation estimator, is this actually better than the corresponding trend test split estimator? Now uh, it's easy to see that they have the same expectation, so really uh, what we expect in the variance and maybe higher moments, although we'll, we'll mostly see that the variance is the thing that matters. So a natural hope to have maybe is that you know, if uh, you don't have too many folds, maybe uh, the folds behave mostly as if they were independent. So maybe you get like a k-fold reduction variance. Right? So if they were independent, then this is an average of k things that are here. And so hopefully we can get like a k-fold reduction variance. Um, now the main difficulty is that actually you know, the folds are not actually independent. Right? Because using the same data to train and test, uh, the analysis becomes much more complicated. So let me mention uh, some of the existing analysis that I've done. So probably the, the first one was uh, Bloom, Kala, and Langford. And what they showed that is that uh, certainly the variance is more equal and actually under some mild regularity conditions, it's actually strictly less. But um, what we like is kind of a reduction of factor of k, not just like being slightly less. So more recently, uh, Satyan Kell and uh, some of the co-authors uh, showed that under some stability conditions in your estimator, you actually can actually guarantee a finite k-fold reduction variance up to asymptotic term. And uh, uh, there was a follow-up paper on this after the fact where they kind of studied the stability conditions a bit further. Again, these are inequalities that don't tell us exactly how much the variance is reduced by. And uh, the stability conditions here actually can be a little bit hard to check. It really depends on the estimator. So in my first part, I'm going to present some work that I've been doing uh, with Morgan, who's uh, actually here. And uh, we're studying the asymptotics of cross validation. So in this part, we're going to uh, essentially try to establish a central limit theorem. So a central limit theorem is a statement of the type, you know, uh, some scaling of 
the cross-validation estimator minus its expectation value converges to a normal with some given variance. And so it has kind of three components, and uh, this is why it's a powerful tool to understand you know, the behavior of these things asymptotically. So first, we're going to be able to characterize the rate of convergence. So this is the alpha here. So kind of how fast does this thing go to that? And then uh, a very powerful thing that the central limit theorem gives us, it, it gives us kind of sharp constants up to the second order. Right, so hopefully we can compute the sigma square exactly, and then maybe we can compare it to the corresponding sigma square we get from the trend test split estimator. And this will tell us exactly how much of a reduction variance we get. And finally, there's an interesting kind of uh, more like a meta fact, is that uh, if you have a central limit theorem that tells you that essentially at this given scale, the behavior is fully pretty much summarized by uh, the variance, right? Because uh, a normal is characterized by its variance. Essentially, if you're only interested to the behavior at that order of scale, then you have this universality where essentially everything goes back to a normal. Okay, so let me present the general result and then talk a little bit about it. So it turns out that uh, if you work hard enough, you can in fact get central limit theorems for things that are dependent by being a bit careful. And uh, we can show that you know, under some stability conditions, again on F, uh, we have the general central limit theorem where for the split estimator, we converge to some quantity here. And then for the uh, cross validation estimator, if we rescale by the initial factor of k, we converge to some quantity here. So let me try to give you some intuitions for those quantities. So let's first think about sigma 1 squared and sigma 2 squared. So these are essentially the two quantities that describe the asymptotic behavior of the loss for a simple train test split. So the variance essentially of the split loss has two components. One is the split loss is a Monte Carlo estimator. Right? So even if fixed you, even if promised you, you know, your estimator doesn't do anything, it's a fixed value, you have a uh, central limit theorem of the estimate of the risk around that value. This is described by sigma 1 squared. Now, of course, you don't know the true one, but rather you approach it at a given rate. So if you think f is parametric, this is probably the easiest case to think about. Sigma 2 squared describes kind of the variance of your estimate of f around the true f, whatever the true f might mean. And finally, this is where things get interesting, is that there's a third term that appears for the cross validation estimator, which describes the notion of covariance. So this notion of covariance is maybe a little bit hard to understand. Let me try to give you some intuition. So what the covariance is between is essentially the loss on the dip point in an average sense. So this is the loss you observe on the dip point x prime, average over all the possible estimators you could get. And this is the risk of an estimator where I promise to you that one of the dip points is the one you observe. So actually, I'm looking at the covariance between the loss and the risk once you average out everything else. And we'll see that this is kind of the, the right quantity to look at and that this quantity can actually be non-zero. So if this quantity is exactly zero, then we promise that there's exactly k for reduction invariance. If this quantity is non-zero, then there may be a larger or small than k for reduction invariance, depending on the sign of rho. So uh, this result is a little bit abstract, and uh, it holds in generality, so we don't really make off assumptions of f, except some like stability ones. Uh, but I'm mostly going to present results in a context where f is parametric because uh, parametric estimators are nice and we'll be able to do actually explicit computations. So I'm going to think of f as this parametric m estimator. So for those who know, uh, m estimator or empirical risk minimizer, what it does is we have some loss psi and then we're going to minimize it as a sum over the data point with some parameters. Now here we have to assume that psi is nice. By nice, I mean something like twice differentiable and convex in its second argument. Um, and then it turns out that you know with the power of Taylor expansion and calculus, we can actually give explicit formulas for these things. Uh, and, and here maybe the interpretation is a bit clearer. So sigma one squared corresponds to the asymptotic variance of the loss uh, under the true estimate in some sense. Uh, sigma two squared, the form is a bit complicated here. Uh, but maybe one interesting thing that we can remark, if, if psi is a negative log likelihood, so if you're doing maximum likelihood estimation, uh, then it's kind of a reasonably well known fact in classical statistic that the covariance of the score function is a Fisher formation is equal to the expression of the second derivative of the log likelihood, or negative log likelihood. And so these things actually cancel here, and you only get one H inverse, which is the inverse Fisher information. And so you can see, uh, if you know that you know, the MLE converges to uh, the truth uh, with a covariance given by the Fisher information, this is actually the kind of estimation error in your maximum likelihood projected onto the direction of the risk. And finally, there's a covariance term here, which has to do with uh, the covariance between essentially the score and the loss uh, projected again onto the direction of the risk. Uh, and this is really the term that uh, we're going to look at. Okay, so this is still quite abstract. We can maybe try to make it a bit more concrete by looking at some examples. So maybe let's look at the easy case first, the, the nice case. 
Um, so in the next case, uh, well, you have a parametric case where you're training on this, the same loss as the one you tested. So you're doing ERM, and you're doing it properly in that the loss you're considering, you're using it both for training and testing. Then uh, it's easy to see that C theta star here, which was the optimal of psi, is also the optimal of R. And so this implies that the derivative is 0. And so you see that rho is equal to 0. Actually, I think that we can show a similar result without such needs for differentiability. But there's something in that region is that the idea is that if you have parametric estimator and you're optimizing the same risk as the one you're evaluating, then you always get rho equals 0. So you get kind of the faults behaving as if they were independent. So it's quite nice. And this recovers all of the results that people have seen in practice, all the things that uh, kind of kind of subsumes out of the previous work that has been done. Now, what happens if psi is not equal to L? So it might surprise you, but I feel that actually the case where psi is not equal to L is the more common case that we consider. So for example, if you have a rich estimator, right, the rich estimator doesn't just minimize you know, the loss you care about, let's say the square loss here, but rather it minimizes the penalized square loss. So I can also write it in the form of an M estimator, but here psi picks up an additional term, which is you know, the penalizer. So now what I have is the loss I care about evaluating. Right? Usually when you cross validate the rigid estimator, you look at the mean square error, not the mean square error plus uh, whatever penalizer you have, is a square loss. But the loss I'm training on is this penalized square loss. And so now they're no longer the same. It's still smooth, so I can use the formulas that were given. And if I have a Gaussian design, for example, then I can actually compute exactly rho. So, um, if I don't have uh, exactly a Gaussian design, then the form is a bit different because there's fourth moments. But in, under the Gaussian design, I can resolve all the fourth moments, and I get a form like this. Now, the form is a bit complicated, but the big takeaway is that it's a <laughs> quadratic form with a minus sign in front. And so rho is actually negative for ridge. Which means that for ridge, uh, we should expect uh, faster than k fold convergence. So we can do some experiments. Let's see. So this is ridge with a Gaussian design. And I'm doing two fold cross validation. I am measuring the variance of r hat split and the variance of r hat CB. And I see that actually with two fold cross validation, I get a reduction in variance of about 3.4. So instead of just getting a reduction in variance of two, which you would expect if the two folds were independent, you actually get quite a bit better than that. Right? It's like about 1.5 times better than that. And this is, as we predict, so infinity here is the uh, values we predict using the formulas. Uh, these are simulations uh, based on. Uh, about 50,000 replications each. And I see that what's happening is that, as we predict, the reduction in variance when you go from the split to the cross validation is m higher than 2. So this was actually quite surprising to us. Uh, but when we think about kind of, and we're still trying to develop kind of good intuition for these, uh, but when you think about the covariance between the score and the loss, it kind of makes sense in that uh, for rigid estimator, um, if I tell you that you, know, you have a point that's far away, on average, this will bring down your estimate. Um, so this is the idea here. So this was uh, one of the first surprises we had. And we think that this is actually a pretty natural case. Right? It's not something we cook it up. It's, it's just a natural case. Now, another common thing that we have is that all of our formulas are based on some notion of expedition under the data generation distribution. And so the behavior is not just a property of the estimator. Where you might think, oh, for ridge, you know, it's always like this. For this estimate, it's always like this, or so. And this is not the case. The behavior depends on the interaction between the estimate you, you're using and the data generating distribution. So here, this is another example that we can consider. So we can consider a classification problem. So for a classification problem, it's essentially never the case that psi is equal to L, right? Pretty much uh, every time you train a classifier, you're going to use some kind of surrogate loss that is going to be smooth or something, and you care about the accuracy. Let's say, okay. So in this case, I'm going to consider, uh, you know, the linear discriminant analysis which is a fancy word to say that you, know, you compute the average for one of the classes, you compute the average for the second class, and then to classify the class, which the observation is closer to the average of whichever one. Okay. And so here, I'm going to allow myself to give uh, distributions, arbitrary distributions to each of them, although we're going to be able to use uh, gamma distributions. And so here, uh, this doesn't quite fit in the case where psi and L are differentiable, because uh, Psi uh, L here is a classification, but it's still a simple enough case that we can compute the uh, formulas in closed form, although I don't show them here, they're in the paper. Uh, and then we can see that actually I can create two different setups uh, with two different gamma distributions. So in the so setup, uh, the first distribution is a gamma with uh, shape 10 and scale 
0.15, which has a mean 1.5, and D2 is a gamma 1, 1. So it's an exp exponential one. In the fast setup, uh, D1 is, has shape 1 and scale 10. So this is an exponential with a mean 10, and this is an exponential with mean 1. And now if we look at the simulation in the slow setup, you see that what's happening, so here again, we're doing two-fold cross validation. So what's happening is that we get a speed up of 1.6 times for two-fold cross validation. So the fold are positively corrected, and we don't get as much speed up as we would like. Right? So if we do two-fold, again, we expect kind of two-fold you know, speed up, but no, we, we get like kind of 1.6 times. On the other hand, in the fast setup, we'll have two exponentials. We see that actually by doing two-fold, I get up 2.37 times speed up. So this is faster than two. So this kind of reads to emphasize the fact that it's not enough to know about the estimator. The speed up you observe on cross addition is not just a property of the estimator, it's a property of how the estimator interacts with the data generation distribution. So this is kind of the, the second surprise we have. And, and we see that it's not even that different, right? Like these are two, you know, they're families of gammas. Actually, for this in general, you can show that if you have a location family, you always get exactly a speed up of two times for twofold. If you have different families in terms of scale and so on, then pretty much any behavior is possible. So finally, I'd like to end this section by talking a little bit about the proof technique that we used. So there's actually not that many different ways of proving central limit theorems. And one of the proof techniques that, the main proof technique that we use is uh, something no, known as the Shines method. So I think some of you know about it, but let me try to give a favor of what we do for those who want. So Shines method is based on, based on the following fact. Uh, a variable Z is normally distributed if and only if for any g where essentially this makes sense, this identity hold. The expression of zgz is equal to the expression of g prime of z. You can check a one way very easily. If z is normal, then this holds. You can just check it by integration by parts. Uh, the converse is a little bit more subtle. It has to do with kind of the generator. Um, but you know, it's not, you know, it's maybe probably not that surprising. Now, the nice thing about this is that actually, so this being a, qu a qualitative statement, I can turn it into a quantitative statement. So I can, can essentially put epsilon in there, and that's what's going to help me do the analysis. It holds that for any random variable x, the Wasserstein distance, so the Wasserstein 1 distance between x and sigma z, is bounded by the supremum of over some function class of essentially the difference here. And Shine's method then, uh, in the aim, the goal of Shine's method is that we're going to bound this for the variable of interest. So here x is like, you know, the cross validation estimator. We're going to put in an arbitrary function g, <coughs> And then we're going to work uh, hard to bound this quantity here using tail expansions and other analysis methods. Yeah. Where's f on the right hand side here? Is it g? Oh, sorry, it's g. Sorry, g over all g's of. So yeah, so so this is the main, and the main burden of the proof is then being able to show this. Now, for those who know a bit more, uh, there are some applications of shine method which are very kind of very miraculous, where maybe there's some coupling or something that makes this happen automatically. Uh, this is not one of those cases. And so if you read the chapter G survey, which is great on this method, he would call it kind of the generalized perturbative method or something like this. And so, but by doing enough, it's long, but it's and somewhat technical, but not completely like crazy, uh, we can work out something like this. And so in fact, uh, because it's quantitative, all the results I presented earlier actually in fact vary a seam down. So we can characterize the convergence speed to normal in addition to the fact that it converges to a normal. Uh, but the, the formulas are somewhat long and uh, they're not that important to the main message. Okay. Uh, so this is it for the first part. Uh, let me just take any questions for this first part. Yeah. Did you explore any cases where the, I guess the minimum or maximum, or whatever you want to call it, optimal for the, the metric you're evaluating mm -hmm. the algorithm on is different than the metric you're using to optimize the algorithm? So if there's a bias between the two? Yeah, so this is exactly kind of what is happening in the ridge. So in the ridge, okay, yeah. essentially what's happening is it depends on the difference here. Yeah. Um, now, there are also cases where things happen and the maxima are the same. Uh, we need to investigate this a bit more, but uh, so it doesn't happen for smooth things, but for example, if you, I think if you optimize the least squares and you check the mean absolute error instead of the mean square error, then there's some strange, strange things that happen. Now, the mean absolute error is not differentiable, so our formulas don't apply directly. Uh, but uh, from our simulations, we can tell that you know, some strange things are also happening. Um, so, yeah, so as a summary, uh, we have a general theorem for estimators verifying some stability conditions, which are kind of very similar to the ones before, so there's some kind of L2 stability conditions. And 
in the case of parametric MS methods, we have an explicit formula, which is uh, usually computable if you know the data changing distribution. In general, you can expect a full speed up that is a careful reduction variance for parametric models when you train on exactly the loss you're considering. But when this is not the case, uh, there can be uh, a, a wide number of surprising behaviors, actually. Now, there are also some other things that I didn't have time to talk about in detail. Uh, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, this actually is uh, something that pretty much all the papers have to handle, is that when sigma 1 squared is 0, that is when the loss has no variance under the true generating instrument. For example, what could happen is you're flipping a coin, it's 0, 1, and you're looking at a mean square error. Right, so if you're flipping a coin, and the mean square error of the, of the best thing you can do, you predict 0.5, the mean square error is always 0.25. Uh, and so what's happening is that sigma 1 squared is 0, uh, we can get to the generic cases, where essentially our theorem says that you know, at the given rate, the things converges to a degenerate normal. And so if you want to study that, you have to go to a high rate. Uh, but as you might expect, so from like a delta method or something like this, if you take a normal one and go to a high rate, you get into a chi squared. And so the um, convergence, the converging, the asymptotic distribution is slightly different, and it requires slightly different analysis. And also, you won't be able to have these kind of things. So even when psi equals to L, if sigma 1 square is 0, you can get different things than full speed up, because uh, you're not allowed to use our theorem to get the, the, to deduce the result. You can't divide 0 by 0, so that's kind of what's happening here. Um, another question that is interesting to uh, consider is, you know, this quantity here, we would like to be able to estimate it from data, right? That would allow us to build confidence intervals for it. Now, uh, our theorem actually allows k to grow, as long as it grows uh, strictly, small, uh, strictly slower than n. But this is kind of computation intensive, and uh, most applications, k is finite and like more like 5 or 10 or something. Um, and so we have some ideas on how to estimate this, but they're all kind of very computation intensive and are based on some leave one out, uh, which I'm going to talk about later. Uh, so this is uh, something that's interesting and a bit tricky to do right now. So this is something interesting to think about. Finally, um, our theorem mostly applies, so the stability conditions required mostly mean that your estimators have to look parametric in some sense. If you have something like uh, ordinary least squares, where the number of parameters p and the number of samples n grow together jointly, uh, then for OLS with Gaussian design, you can convince yourself, either if you're strictly abiding some computation on the hat matrix, that actually you do have a normal limiting distribution. But it doesn't really fall under the theorem here, and I think the reason is that uh, in hat dimensions, we don't have universality. So, here we were able to be very agnostic to the type of estimate that we had exactly. Because in, uh, in parametric cases, we have universality and essentially all the behavior gets erased and the only behavior that matters is locally around the truth. And this is always a quadratic. In high dimension, this is not true. You don't approach the truth, right? You, 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 you are a constant uh, step away from the truth. And so uh, there's much more subtle behavior. And maybe there are some central limit theorems for some specific cases, but for some of the cases, they're not. Uh, and so this some things that might be interesting to think about. Okay, so I mentioned that the hand dimensional regime is a bit tricky, uh, but there's still some things we can do. Now, before we started, uh, I mentioned that you know the cross relation of the train test split test meter is asymptotically unbiased, but there's still a bias, right? So even though we often say that it's unbiased, what our hard CV and K estimates is a risk if you train on n times k minus one over k points. Right, when you do cross relation or train test splitting, you throw away a fraction, one over k, of your data set. Right. Now, if you have way more data points than you have parameters, throwing a fraction, one over k, of your data set doesn't matter. Right, this is kind of a central limit theorem and, and, and Fisher behavior. But if your ratio is constant, then reducing the sample size by a constant factor affects the estimate in a fundamental fashion. Right, it changes the aspect ratio, which is kind of the central term you need to control when you do high dimensional asymptotax. So let me show you an example. Here, I have the lasso with uh, n is 800 and p is 1,000. In red, I have the true out of sample risk or ex estimated prediction, uh, expected prediction error. In green, I have the five-fold estimate of my risk. And in yellow, I have the leave one out estimate of my risk. So leave one out is k for cross decision with k equal to n each time, only remove one point. And you see that you know, the, the five-fold is, uh, is biased. It's, it's not close to the, to the expected prediction error. Uh, and the reason is exactly due to the fact that you know, lasso is sensitive to the ratio between n and p. And when I do 5-4 cross relation, I change the ratio between n and p. 
Now, you can also construct more artificial cases where you can imagine for the sooner about the phase transition of the lasso, I can place myself just above the phase transition. And then when I do 5 fold cross transition, I'll fall just under. And so the behaviors will be completely different. And so this is uh, something that is interesting because the bias reduces as the number of folds increases. Right? Uh, and so maybe we can hope to analyze the extreme case maybe of Lee one cross transition where the number of folds equal n. Now, one of the worries that people always had about Lee one cross transition and similar schemes is that the variance could be very high. Right? Because essentially you're sharing nearly all your points between the estimators. Uh, you could imagine that maybe there's large correlations between folds. Uh, it turns out that in the specific case of PNAS GMs uh, that we can consider, it will not be the case. So just as a remainder of what is a PNAS GM? A PNAS GM is a M estimator of this floating form, where you imagine that you observe Y X I, and then essentially what happens is you have a loss, and the only interaction between the features and your parameters comes through this linear term. This is the main thing. So L is allowed to be nonlinear, anything you want, uh, or convex. R is allowed to be kind of pretty much anything you want, as long as it's convex. The main feature here is that there's this linear interaction here that kind of allows us to control how the high dimensional interaction be, uh, behaves. So because the sizes of these two things, right, the, the number of elements in X and the number of elements P is going to grow, uh, being able to control this in a kind of a fixed way is uh, really essential to be able to do analysis in high dimensions. Now it's a very general class of model. It contains things like the lasso estimator, like the SMEM estimator. If you do any kind of matrix completion or things like this, usually it's also in this domain. Um, and the important thing is that it's going to decouple the high dimensional uh, interaction, which is the tricky thing with the prediction loss L. Okay, so what can we do? Well, so actually, so in a recent paper that we, not on our archive yet, but we sent the ASAT, is uh, with Kamiar uh, at Baruch and uh, my advisor Arin. We showed that if um, yxi is well behaved, so say maybe it has all five moments, so maybe five fourth moments plus epsilon, if you really want something like this, and L is smooth, uh, so this is quite a strong condition actually in this case. Maybe you have to imagine like bounded third moments or something like this, which is really quite strong, but logistic works on some other small cases that we can kind of do manually. We can show that under the high dimensional asymptotic, which is when n goes to infinity and n op goes to constant, we can actually show that. The Lee Van estimator is a consistent estimate of the risk on elements, and it's consistent at a tight rate. Okay, so this rate here, one of n, you can't do better than that. Well, in general, you wouldn't expect to do better than that because of the central limit theorem. So even if I told you what the true estimator was, you have by the central limit uh, error one of n estimating the risk of any fixed thing. Uh, the constant here, see, uh, is not tight. It's we use a lot of concentration and things like this, and there's loads of constants that go on. So this is in stark contrast with the previous work that we have, or with uh, Morgan in the case of central limit theorem. I can, exa I can resolve exactly the constant here. Uh, for this, uh, unfortunately, in the high dimensional regime, we can't. But at least we know that you know, it does converge at the right rate. Uh, the proof uh, I'm going to present here, I don't find it super nice. I think maybe we need to work a little bit more on it. It's based on uh, ideas of tail expansion and mean value theorems and so on. And we can work it out. Okay, so in some sense, this seems to suggest that at least in the context of PNAS GMs, leave one out might be a reasonable idea in high dimension. Right, so in high dimensions, uh, actually we're also worried about bias. Maybe like, you know, usually, you know, we think in statistics, you know, variance is the thing that kills us. You know, bias, whatever, it eventually disappears. You know, variance is really the thing that we should worry about. But in high dimension statistics, actually bias is, is a much more important factor. And we should rethink about it. And so maybe in this case, leave one out is, is a good idea to do. So finally, the next work I'm going to present is uh, some work that I've done with of colleagues at Columbia, uh, Haru, who was at MIT, is now at Google, and Bahab, who's at Google. Uh, so this work is in ICML, was published in ICML in 2018. So as we've seen before, uh, the Lee one cross validation is statistically desirable. At least we can prove that kind of good properties in the high-dimensional regime of Lee one cross validation. Now the problem is, even if you want to use it, it's just computationally intractable. Right, having to fit your model n times where n is potentially large, uh, you can't really do it. So you know, we can do some simulations where we spend a lot of computational time on a cluster, but it's not really a practical way to do data analysis. So the question is, you know, maybe we can obtain a fast approximation of the D1 of cross validation risk without having to go through all this computational trouble. Okay, so let's think about uh, what we know in the very standard case. So some of you might have seen this before. If you have a linear smoother, which means that the predicted y hat 
is some linear function of y, conditional on x, then there's actually a closed form expression for the Lyman estimates. So for example, for OLS, so for LS, S here is this matrix here. You can show that the leave one out residual is the n sample residual rescaled by some quantity here, which is usually called the leverage. Um, so if you use R and you run like LM and you call plot on it, it will show you, you know, scale leverage and so on. And so this notion of leverage is actually kind of quite important in the, in the like classical theory of um, linear models and is something that essentially predicts, you know, how much is your prediction affected by yourself? And then we're going to cancel that out to try to figure out what if you were in here. So in the case of OS, this is exact. The leave one out cross validation, uh, so the leave one out residual for the i data point is exactly the n sample residual divided by this because of the linear relationship here. So we can cancel this out exactly. Now, maybe we can do this, maybe not exactly, for models that don't satisfy this, but you know, maybe kind of they get close to something like this. So let's think about our P and I GLM again. Right, so the P and I GLM has this functional form. So this is the loss for beta. And this is a leave i out loss. Right, so instead of summing over all the points from 1 to n, I sum over all the points except the i-th one. Um, now the idea is beta hat, right, the estimate for the full data, and the estimate for the full data minus one point, hopefully they're not too far. Right, I only removed one point, so if my estimate is like not too bad, then hopefully they didn't move that far. So maybe one idea is we can try to approximate this quantity by essentially initializing at the quantity for the full data and doing one step of a good optimization method. So maybe here, a one Newton step. Right, so we're going to start at beta hat. We're going to take a Newton step in the direction of uh, beta hat i, minimizing this. And we're going to call this our kind of approximate solution. Um, so the Newton step is given by you know, Hessian inverse times gradient. Uh, maybe a slightly different way to think about doing a, an approximate solution is this is the exact solution to a, an approximate problem. Right, so the Newton step is exact when everything is quadratic. Right, the Newton step solves the quadratic surrogate of your problem exactly. So what we're doing is this is the solution of the quadratic version of this problem where we expanded all the things as quadratics around the truth. So if everything was quadratic already, then this is exact. So for example, for ridge, where both the loss and the regress are quadratic, then this is actually exact. Uh, for things that are not already quadratic, well, as long as you don't move too far, you know, hopefully Taylor, Taylor approximation is still something reasonable to do, and, and we can have this. Now, this doesn't quite dig us out yet, because you see uh, there's this matrix here that depends on i that we need to invert. And so if you need to do that every single time, then you know, it doesn't really help you, because you need to invert a big matrix n times, and this is off computation. Uh, so yeah, so the problem is, you know, can we compute this efficiently for all i? And this is where we're going to be re helped by the structure of our estimator. So let's try to compute the Hessian. So the Hessian of uh, this leave i r problem, see, because this is a sum, right? We can see that it's the Hessian of the full problem minus the Hessian of the loss on the i point. And now this is really where we leverage the generalized linear structure of a problem, is that this thing is a rank-one perturbation. Right, so the Hessian of the full problem differs by the Hessian of the divider problem by rank-one matrix. And so you might know there's a formula to update your inverse by rank-one matrix, and we can use it. Right, so we can just say that the this is equal to this. Now this, once I have each inverse, this is fast to compute. And this is really the thing that saves us, and, and why our method really kind of relies in a very fundamental way on the generalized linear strategy, it, this expansion here. And so we can plug this into, into Newton's formula to get this general formula. And then uh, you get a general formula which says that the leave i out predicted is an in sample predicted plus some adjustment to compensate for both you know, the, the loss, so the direction of the loss. So in the least square case, this is just a residual, and then uh, some notion of leverage. Uh, now, this is a general formula, and in the smooth case, it has a provable accuracy. So you can prove that this is not too far from the true leave one out. So uh, Camera and Aaron did in their paper. And because we also have the result that the true leave one out, uh, its risk is not too far from the true risk out of sample, this, actually in the smooth case, 
is probably, is probably close to the true risk at the 1 over n rate, or a property log n over n rate. Um, now, the problem is, in the high dimensional setting, uh, usually you want to use some non-smooth estimate, right? Because uh, a non-smooth opinionizer, what it buys you is the ability to impose structure on your estimates. Right? It's, uh, you cannot impose structure with a smooth estimate because it, look, it looks like a quadratic. But if you, have, you know, if you have some notion of sparsity or low rank, and you use a non-smooth estimate, still convex, you can impose that structure. For example, for the lasso, right? For the lasso, you have this. The problem is that now our regular the R, which is the one norm, is not differentiable everywhere. Now you might think, okay, it's not differentiable everywhere, it's differentiable almost everywhere, right? So maybe we can get lucky. Well, unfortunately, we get the opposite of lucky. We get very unlucky, right? Beta hat, which is where we need to take our second derivative, is sparse. This is the exact place where you cannot take the derivative. And so we're not going to apply, be able to apply the formula directly. Now, it turns out that actually, um, if you're very careful and you smooth out this, and then you take the limits very carefully, you can figure it out. And we have that in the paper. But uh, this can be, for some problems, especially when the regress is non separable, it can be very tricky. So I'm going to present a slightly different alternative to computing it, which is much more geometric in thinking. Uh, it does require a bit of convex analysis, though, so let me walk you through it. So because that's is a convex problem, it's equivalent to it's a convex dual. Uh, sorry, so let me present the, the estimate first, and then uh, some results, and then we'll talk about how to derive it. So I claim that Lasso can be approximated using the same formula, where the H-matrix is now only involves the active set. So essentially what I've done is I've thrown away all the variables that weren't active, and I only have the active set. So one more thing about this is exact. If the active set doesn't change when you remove one estimator, right? When you remove this observation, if the active set doesn't change, then this is exact, otherwise it's not exact. And so one way to think about this is that the allo residual, right? is the insupport residual rescaled by the leverage. So does this work in practice? Well, yeah, it works well in practice. So this is the D1 out versus idle risk estimates for Lasso. And uh, I didn't say it here, but one interesting thing is that these are misspecified models. So here, I think Y is actually the uh, XI transpose beta cubed. And here we have some uh, noise or something that is like T distributed. So because cross-validation is not something that's model-based, right? And like something like sure or something like this, we're not assuming a given model when we do cross-validation, we just assume that the variables come in IID. Uh, it matches quite well even outside of you know, the model specification. Uh, additionally, um, we see that it's quite fast. So what we can hope for is that with a good implementation, uh, we can get the speed to around you know, the same order the second fit. So morally, right, computing the Hessian inverse at the truth should be similar to solving the optimization problem for like a smooth form. You can think that the computing the Hessian inverse, so you can solve a smooth form like a constant h number of steps using Newton method. So if you can compute the Hessian inverse, that's about the same cost as solving the problem. And you can see that this happens here. Now, leave one out takes like a crazy amount of time, but that's kind of what we expect. And this also works for like SVM and nuclear norm minimization and all these kind of things. So we see that it kind of matches quite well. Now, for us, so let me can try to give you a favor. So we have a lot of more examples in the paper of how you might derive something like this for lasso. So for the lasso, you might know that there uh, is a very, very nice dual actually for the lasso. And most regression, like convex regression problems actually have a very nice dual. So let me try to explain to you if you haven't seen it before. So what I can do is I can I have this problem problem, which is this minimization problem. What I can do is I can introduce a W, w which I'm going to put in here, and constrain W equals x transpose beta. So this is equivalent. And now what I can do is I can dualize the problem, right? This is a constraint, I'm going to flip it to, uh, I'm going to put in Lagrange multipliers. I'm going to flip the problem, right? Okay, so this is the dual problem. And the dual problem is actually very writable in closed form, right? You see that the dual problem corresponds to a minimization of a square loss, so it to some constraint. In the last of the constraint is actually particularly nice. This is a polytope, right? Because, uh, because this is linear and this is kind of, a polytope, this is a transform polytope, so it has a kind of linear faces. And I can write it in closed form as a projection. Uh, for general losses, you might not have a projection, you might have a proximal operator, but they behave in very similar ways uh, from a convex perspective. Right, so I can write down the exact uh, dual, and by the problem dual corresponds, I actually know that this is uh, the residual as a projection of my original data point onto some convex point. Okay, so how, how does that help me? Well, let's try to look at the leave i out problem. So in the leave i out problem, Again, I have my problem problem. Problem problem is easy to write. I have my dual problem. Now, the thing that's a bit awkward here 
right, is that the dual problem now changes in dimension. Right, because the dual problem is on the residuals, it has dimension n. And so when I do the out, it has dimension n minus 1. Now, my whole shtick right, was to try to use the solution of the primal to approximate the solution of the dual. But if they have different dimensions, this is going to be tricky. OK, so there's a dimension mismatch. So what we can do, and you might have seen this proof for uh, linear smoothness before, is we're going to lift the problem. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stick in a fake observation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stick back in the observation I removed, but put it exactly on the regression line. Right. So what I'm doing here, I'm sticking back in a fake observation, yai. I'm going to give it the value of the thing here, which is the predicted leave i out value of that thing. I don't, I don't know this value, but I can still mathematically write this. Right. And you see that this has the same optimal value, because this was optimal, and I add 0. There's no way that I add less than 0, and so it ha it's still optimal. Now, this restores the dimension, and I can write you know, the tilde to the pro to projection of this augmented observation set. Right, so what I do is I didn't change x. I moved y a little bit. I changed y in the coordinate of the thing I removed in order to add it back in. And now I have this. And because that I know that you know, I added this back on the regression line, it must be that the i residual is exactly 0. This is by the construction of my problem. And so now I have this problem which is back in the original dimension. I can maybe do something. So maybe this is a bit hard to think about. Let's, let's think about it from a geometry perspective. So what I'm doing is I have my original point y. And I know that I can move my point y in the i coordinate to an augmented y a, which is kind of the uh, augmented y, which corresponds to the Levi out problem. Now, I know that my estimator, right, my, my uh, dual optimal, it corresponds to projection of y onto uh, this point of, which I kind of drawn here as a box kind of thing. All right, and so when I move y in this action, what I'm doing is I'm moving the optimal along the projection also. And the projection, we can compute it very explicitly. Because we know that the face here, by doing some easy computation, you can see that the face here is spanned by essentially the active set, uh, or the complete model of the active set. And so, and so the orthogonal space of this face is, is uh, spanned by the active set. And so when we project, we project onto the orthogonal complement of this. And so what we can do is actually we can linearize this thing. Right? So this is exact as long as I don't cross a face. If a cross of face is not only exact, but maybe I don't cross a face very often and still close enough. So this is how I get my estimator for the case where, uh, uh, where we get to use uh, the approximation. And from this, we can do some easy competition and, and see that we get the same form. So this idea is uh, we, uh, one of the driving ideas behind there is there, uh, OK behind uh, of the computation that we can do uh, for, for a lot of uh, regularizers that look like norms. So if you have something like generalized lasso, where you don't regularize uh, beta, but you regularize some linear function of beta, or if you have something like slope, um, these are non-separable norms that are convex regularizers. Now, smoothing separable things is kind of OK, because you smooth them in one dimension, and then that's fine, so some. Smoothing non-separable convex things is really quite difficult because you know there's a lot of interactions between dimensions and, and you smoothing you have to it's not a n one dimensional problem, it's a n dimensional problem which is much harder. Um, now we can actually show that um, by being careful uh, that there's an equivalence between the primal and dual problem. Uh, and this is formed in terms of partial quadratics in the convex sense, and it holds even for non-smooth problems. So let, let me try to explain to you what happened. Like I had some like infinities, right? Where did I hide them, right? Like uh, my, so this problem is not smooth, and I had this infinity hashing, and I can't make it disappear, right? There's no magic in this. I must have transformed somewhere. Okay, so let's look at the dual problem. The dual problem has this projection, right? And the projection is also non differentiable everywhere. It's not a smooth function, but projection being a quadratic operator, right, is differentiable almost everywhere. Now, R1 was also differentiable almost everywhere, but we were unlucky in the sense that every time we want to take the derivative at beta hat, we would end up in a place where it was not differentiable. Here we have the opposite problem, right? So because we take the projection at y, and if you imagine y you know, being x transpose beta plus epsilon, y usually has continuous distribution with respect to the bag. And so it turns out that here, I can pretty much, with probability 1, take the derivative of this thing. So I can linearize around here. 
And so you, you might ask the question, well, what happened? You know, why could you not take the derivative then? Why can't you take the derivative here? Uh, well, it has to do with an asymmetry of standard calculus, which is that we lack uh, zeros are fine, but infinities are not okay. Right? If I think of a quadratic, right, ax squared, um, then this is fine, and a equals zero is fine. But a equals infinity doesn't make sense in the standard calculus setting. Now, if you're maybe an expert in convex analysis, you might know that you know, uh, quadratics have this duality under the uh, convex conjugate, where uh, quadratic a squared, uh, half, one half a squared gets transformed to one half, one over two a x squared. And this kind of extends even beyond the case where you know, uh, your quadratic is non-singular. Essentially, if a becomes zero, you get this convex function, which is defined only at zero, which takes values zero as zero and infinity on the rest of the thing. And from a convex analysis sense, you can make perspective, you can make sense of that. And this is exactly what's happening here. Instead of the Taylor approximation constructing this full convex uh, quadratic approximation around the truth, uh, what we're, what's happening here is we're com computing this partial quadratic approximation around the truth. So we're allowing dimensions where essentially we're saying it doesn't move at all. So the, along, if we were to kind of diagonalize around that direction, the quadratic will be completely collapsed and will be like a straight line up. And so this is kind of the, what's happening. And in front of calculus, essentially it's because we don't have the symmetry between the flat line and the completely straight quadratic. This is the only symmetry we don't have. And so somehow by transforming through the convex, which kind of allows us to take the inverse, we took some infinities to become zeros, like in a coherent way, and, and everything worked out. Okay. Now, I should mention that um, the general idea of trying to approximate these Lee one-out things has been a very active field of research. And there's, of, I mean, risk estimation in general is, is an interesting problem that a lot of people have thought about. Now, I, I do think that the current framework we have is kind of the best for the scenario presented, but I should mention that there exist other methods that have their own advantages. So one of the popular methods is called Schur, which is the sign unbiased risk estimator. So for, the, for the, those who don't know it, it's based on this notion of degrees of freedom, but uh, the sign unbiased risk estimator is model-based. It depends quite significantly on a normal assumption on your distribution, uh, because it's derived, you know, you can either derive it through some message, approximate message passing strategy or, or some other strategy like this, but it, it, it's quite dependent on model-based. And also, it estimates uh, not quite the out-of-sample risk, so it estimates the risk conditional x. Right? The out-of-sample risk is, what if I resample my x? The standard unbiased risk method is, suppose fix my x, I resample my y, what's going to happen? Um, now, the iteration is that the trace of h, so the trace of the hat matrix we derived, is essentially the degrees of freedom. It's, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, if you set it up correctly, you see that you get the same definition. There's another popular alternative called uh, the infinitesimal jack knife, which was proposed by uh, Ryan Giordano, Michael Jordan, uh, Tamar Broderick, and some other people. And uh, the advantage of IJ is that uh, it's uh, much more flexible. So the animal framework I presented only works for GLMs. If you have a peanut GLM, then you can apply it. But if you have another M estimator where the you know, interaction between your uh, predictor and the parameters is not linear, then uh, it's not quite going to work because you're not going to be able to, to do the trick where you do rank one matrix inversion. So they propose an alternative, which is similar, but slightly different. But one other thing to mention is that uh, idle has a much, much better behavior when p is large compared to m. So if you try to use uh, this, say, for a GWAS analysis or, or some genetics, where I say you have p, you have 2,000 genes and like 20 observations, uh, IG is going to tell you to select uh, no regularization at all. It's going to say, well, you know what? Uh, actually, if, if you don't do any regularization at all, that's where the risk is the smallest. It's, uh, it's very overly optimistic when the residuals become small, whereas uh, uh, ALO is uh, much more faithful in that case. Uh, so finally, there's some work in progress. I'm thinking about some applications in neuroscience where they use uh, penized uh, autoregressive models or with uh, L1 outliers and things like this. So this is uh, some, some things I'm thinking about. Now, there's so many unanswered questions. Uh, these whole ideas around essentially a linearization, uh, as uh, I call them now, um, kind of break down in the interpolating regime. So, the interpolating regime to me is the case where essentially your estimator is flexible enough that it's able to exactly match the uh, observed value for every data point. So neural networks, right? <coughs> um, now, if this happens, then IJ or ALO, they all break down. Uh, so IJ predicts a risk of zero. ALO predicts a risk of infinity. It, 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 it's not like faithful to what's happening. Um, and a general interesting question, I think that uh, I want to think about is you know how fast calculus produce you know reasonably fast estimates of the risk 
in the regime where this happens. Now, in some sense, the linear description is not good enough because essentially what we're predicting here, the linear regime is kind of a worst case analysis. No, if this happens, then certainly I can construct distributions where essentially uh, I force you to kind of overfit all the noise and then when I refit something else, the worst thing happens. But we know from experience with neural networks and all these kind of estimates that actually for reasonable distributions out there, this is not what happens, right? Even if you have interpointing pointing estimates, that doesn't mean you have infinite risk. And so uh, this is uh, an interesting question to potentially think about in the future. Yeah, thanks all. Do you explore any cases where <clears throat> the data dependent term in your loss function was something that wasn't quadratic, maybe like a two key loss or some other unestimator where the quadratic set may change and be a little bit more uh, data dependent? Um, for this? Your for these idols? idols? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we do it also for logistic and things like this. There's, there's no issues with that. The, and actually, SVM, SVM uh, is, a, is a quadratic regularizer, but a, a non smooth also is a, a rich loss and a quadratic regularizer. Um, the, for smooth loss, it's usually not a problem. Like a quadratic approximation is, is good, right? If you think logistic and uh, row weighted these squares, that's usually good. Um, so one thing I didn't mention is that for the non-smooth case, we don't we can't get a theorem that guarantees the accuracy of these things. And the, the reason is the following, is that um, when we look at the theorem that uh, Kamiya and Aryan proved for the smooth case, they show a uniform convergence of uh, the approximation to the truly one out. So it shows for every sample you have, you get a bound at the right rate. My intuition is that this is not true for non-smooth cases. Uh, the reason being that for non-smooth cases, sometimes you cross one of the non-smooth boundaries and you get like kind of a constant size loss. But there's only about one over, like a, a proportion one over root 10 of cases where that happens. And so when you average everything out, it still works out, which is why we see good performance in practice. Um, I should mention, uh, there's a paper by um, Will Stephenson and Tamara Broderick where they look at one case. So if you're in the case for lasso, uh, where you can guarantee exact recovery, uh, so where you have like all the incoherence requirements, then this also holds for each of the leave i odd problems. So if you have this requirement for um, the whole data set, then with that property, you have it for all of the leave i odd ones. And in that case, you get exact approximation, right? Because when the support doesn't change, and it's always a true support, then this is an exact approximation, and everything works out. Unfortunately, uh, this requires tuning. Right? There were some tuning that you don't know, and usually we want to use this for tuning. So it's kind of uh, it's not quite what we want yet, but it's an interesting direction. <clears throat> Anybody else? <laughs> 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 um, and so, like you can imagine, lead one up, especially having uh, interesting impacts when you have strong outliers in your data, and so points that are high leverage and. And so as a result, you're not only could you be shifted, but the quadratic term that you're using in your step could also be potentially uh, pointing in the wrong direction if the concavity of your function changes. Do you have a sense of how that would play out? Yeah, so when you mean strong outliers, you mean strong x outliers or strong? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think because we get these so unlike uh, methods like uh, generalized cross validation or sure or something like this, we use the individual leverage for each of the data points, yeah. rather than using some average leverage or average thing. And so this means that um, we're kind of lucky in that these two quantities cancel. Right? High leverage points in general have low residual because they predict themselves kind of strongly. And so when essentially when this is large, this is small. And so um, in practice, my feeling is that you get this beneficial cancellation between these two effects. That kind of actually overall reduces the variance of what's going on. And so um, I can construct uh, kind of a somewhat, somewhat contrived examples where um, I can make these two kind of very, uh, so have a negative covariance, but in a typical example, they have a positive covariance, and this really helps um, things together.